Alice's Law Center, located in Pennsylvania. Um, next is Patricia Vickers. She is an organizer with the Human Rights Coalition and the Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration um, in Pennsylvania. Next, we have um, Ms. Kelly Savage Rodriguez of Drop Elwa and California Coalition of Women Prisoners. Um, we have Stanley Jamel Bellamy, an organizer with Release Aging People in Prison, or RAP, located in New York. And lastly, we have Anthony Hingle Jr., an ambassador with the Visiting Room Project located in Louisiana. So welcome to these panels. Um, so I'm gonna ask all of our panelists to answer the same few questions, and then we'll give the audience um, the opportunity to um, ask the panel um, questions at the end of this, okay? Um, so my first question, um, for the panel is, can you share with us how you came to this work of challenging the U.S.'s racist and cruel practice of death by incarceration? And can you also talk about how um, about your advocacy, what your advocacy looks like in your state? I want to start with Kelly. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as you said, I'm Kelly Savage Rodriguez. I was sentenced in California. I did 23 years on Life Without the Possibility of Parole and was absolutely blessed to have the advocacy of the California Coalition for Women Prisoners be involved in my experience most of my incarceration. Um, so they taught me how to advocate, um, why it was important to stand up for ourselves and figure out like what, um, what our existence looked like right where we were. And um, with that, we started pushing the narrative about um, us being invisible and why we needed to do something different. And it started with a storytelling project that turned into um, a visual aid um, opportunity with with um, graphics uh, um, sent in, um, graphics both from incarcerated people and um, artists on the outside and a video telling story of what it looked like to serve the sentence um, not realizing that that campaign um, and that drive would lead to something like the Drop and Lock Coalition. We were just trying to make sure that people considered more than just um, individuals serving a death sentence or individuals serving life in California because no one was talking or understood what was happening with, with people serving LWAP. And so in doing that, it created not only um, a lot of hope and encouragement, but it also gave people an opportunity to be heard um, in ways that even in the court system they hadn't. And it, it allowed people to stand up and, and be noticed for the first time. So it was an absolute blessing to be able to do that, not realizing that it would not only affect myself, but so many others in the institution and, and across the state. And it gave people not only incarcerated people, but families hope as well. Um, that's part of the hardest part of, of our sentence is the effects it has on our families. So it, it really um, motivated a lot of families. It even got a lot of families more involved with the incarcerated population than they were in the past because they finally started to see that there was option. And, and so I was extremely blessed to be able to do that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Well, ladies, that's good morning. <laughs> As he said, my name is Stanley Jamel Bellamy. I'm an organizer with Releasing Aging People in Prison. I'm also part of the People's Campaign for Parole Justice, and I'm part of what we call the Clemency Collective. Um, Nikki asked the question, what brought me to this advocacy? I was incarcerated. I was transferred from Attica State Prison to Green Haven State Prison in 1989. And when I arrived in Green Haven, there was older gentlemen, Eddie Ellis, these are, these are stewards, what we call giants in the new prison movement. And they asked a basic question. And that question was, 
How is it that Blacks and Latinos together only make up less than 25% of the general population, um, state population, but at the same time make up 85% of the prison population? And 75% of that number is coming from New York City. And they looked at it, it wasn't just coming from New York City, it was coming from seven specific neighborhoods and 18 assembly districts. And so when they asked that question, he said, hold up, how is it? We make up less, percent, less than 25% of the state population, but make up 85% of the prison population. So that what brought me to this action, trying to answer that question. And so we created what we call the non-traditional approach to criminal and social justice. And when you look at this report that we put together, later on, years later, you will see that uh, Michelle Alexander and her book, The New Dim Jim Crow, basically parroted everything we was talking about in the 90s. But she popularized it, she put it out. When we did this, we was talking about it, we incarcerated individuals and they look at us like, y'all don't know what you're talking about. So they commissioned studies to find out that yes, we did know what we was talking about. The prison, the, um, when you talk about the um, school to prison pipeline, they recognized that when they did their report, they just called a report, it's called Unhealthy Choices. And they recognized that somewhere like 10 schools in New York City produced over 75% of the prison population. So it was a connection from the schools that we was going to, to the prison. So that, and this was, we talked about this in the 90s. So this is what brought me to this after. When I got to Green Haven, I began to learn about this. I said, oh my God, I need to get involved in this because I was serving a 62 and a half years to life sentence. We wasn't even looking at the sentence at the particular time. We was looking at the whole dynamics of how our neighborhoods was being criminalized. They did a report, another um, newspaper article, which you I, I probably heard it called Million Dollar Blocks. Have any of y'all heard of that Million Dollar Block report? Well, it talks about and they used um, East New York. And it talks about this block. It cost $30,000 to um, incarcerate one individual at the time when they did this report. So they saying this is a million dollar block. That means they got at least 33 people off that block that's incarcerated that they paying 30,000 a year to incarcerate. And this was all over the state, um, um, city of New York. You had million dollar blocks where they was incarcerated black and Latino youth. So when I came to this, actually, that's what we came to address. And while I was incarcerated, I wrote bills, took part in writing bills, took part in advocating for life without parole, even for you know the type of sentences I had. And then in 19, and in 2018, one of my comrades, Jose Saladano, went home, and he joined RAP, and he became the director of RAP. And what he did, since we was working so much in the institution, the prison system, he reached back into the prison system and recruited me to become their voice on the inside and make the recruitment. And so that's what I did on the inside. I became their recruiter to get people, family members involved in this advocacy because it was important that we understand that we needed to play a role inside, you know, and outside in changing the system. So. With this, uh, it's one other thing I want to mention before I pass this mic. Coming home, but what RAP is doing right now in New York City is that we sponsoring two bills. One is called the 55 and older bill that says that anybody 55 and older who has been in prison for 15 years should be given the opportunity to go to their immediate parole board. Because many of these men that we're talking about that are fit and women, and when you hear me say men, please, don't think I'm excluding the woman. It's just that I've been in a maximum security prison with men for so long that I always say men, but I am also include the women. That anybody 55 and older. We know that most of these people that's 55 and older came to prison in their late teens and early 20s, and now they're 55 years. So they've been in prison more than 15 years. I came to prison when I was 24. 23, since when I was 24, and did 37 and a half years. So we said anybody, 55, we don't care what type of sentence you have, 55 and older, been in prison 15 years or more, we believe you should get the opportunity to go to the parole board. The other bill we sponsor 
is the fan timely parole bill. We saying that, again, we're not saying that anybody should be released. We saying give them an opportunity. But the fan timely parole bill says that when somebody goes to the board, judge them on the merit of the person they are today as opposed to who they were 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago. Because we recognize that no matter what, the crime will never change, but the individual can change. So that's what the bill's response is. And that's what we're doing right now. Yeah. Um, Anthony, so I, I know that um, in the film earlier, um, you know, Sammy, that was in the film. Can you tell us about what your advocacy looks like um, and like how you got started? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm Anthony Hingle Jr. from New Orleans, Louisiana, ambassador with the Vision One Project. I came into this advocacy work from being directly impacted, from serving a DBI sentence, which is labeled mandatory life sentence in Louisiana. I was released after serving 32 years. Um, while I was incarcerated, being part of incarcerated clubs, we were drafting bills that we was trying to turn into laws where we would be afforded opportunity for a parole or pardon review. Because when I arrived at Angola in 1990, it wasn't but like one person going home every other year. You know, so with that being said, it had turned into like a warehouse of elderly people. I mean, you went from having a hospital that had two wards to makeshifting units that had turned into nursing homes where you was housing like 86 men to one dormitory. So it's maybe four domes as medical domes in this camp, four domes as medical domes in this camp, and so on. But while incarcerated, you want to do uh, exalt every avenue that you possibly can to try to make a way to come home. So. I was fortunate enough to come home after Louisiana had and worked and worked to getting a new governor in the office. Well, well, we was able to get a new governor in office. Yeah, I was pretty much leaning to walls, pretty much leaning to walls, trying to let a few people come home. I can't say for whether or not it was because he actually felt like well, a person had been dead over 20 years and he had to change and better himself and be productive in, in, in society, or whether or not he was just trying to get Louisiana from being number one in mass incarceration. So what he did, he actually sent home maybe 1,500 people that had like small sentences. And that created a conflict because you had private jails of uh, city jails that was ran by people that was like, if the governor gonna be sending the good people home, then who's gonna watch our cause? You know, as inmates, as incarcerated people. But when I came home, I joined an organization called Both Voice of the Experience. And the way we advocate for those that we left behind is we also go to the legislation every session with bills trying to create avenues for not one person to come home, but for hundreds and hundreds of people to come home. So like I said, with this governor in office and with vote getting maybe a few judges in Louisiana in office, a lot of people have started coming home now. But that window is closed because just, what, two, three days ago, a new governor just took office. So now all those people that are incarcerated, it's like their hope has just disappeared already. You know, to the point where a lot of them just started buying tombstone and burial plots outside of the prison that don't want to be buried in prison. You know, so that's what it looked like for me as far as advocacy. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm a Pat. Uh, I know you work with Miss Didi who's in the film um, in Cadby in Pennsylvania. Can you tell us about um, how you came to the work and what your advocacy looks like? Okay. Um, I came into this work in uh, 2001 
Um, but it started when my son uh, was sentenced, arrested and sentenced to life in prison in 1988. Um, now I realize, I didn't realize then that life in prison or life without parole meant that my 17 year old son would die in prison. And at that time, when he received the sentence and received that life without parole sentence, um, it just triggered something in me and I felt a lot of guilt trying to figure out where I went wrong, that my son would end up having life in prison, what I could have done better, what I shouldn't have done, you just go through this whole self-evaluation. And one thing I did tell myself was that even though I couldn't protect him on the outside, I was gonna do everything in my power to protect him on the inside. So whatever he needed, whatever I could do, that's what I was gonna do. In 2001, he wrote me a letter and said he wanted me to be a part of this organization called the Human Rights Coalition an organization that him and other men in prison, uh, Russell, Russell Maroon Schultz, Salim, and my son co-founded this organization inside. And uh, that's how I got started. The unique thing about this organization, the Human Rights Coalition, is that it was, um, It was uh, the men inside, organized inside, and we, the family members, organized on the outside. The unique, unique thing about the Human Rights Coalition was that our advisory board was our loved ones on the inside. They advised us on what to do out here. And because the love that we had for our, our loved ones inside, we did everything that we needed to do. I had no idea on how to organize. I would never been to a courtroom other than with my son. I didn't even know anything about the laws. I didn't know how to hold a town hall meeting. I didn't know how to do any of those things, but our advisory council from the inside said, Mama Pat, do this. Mama Pat, go here. Mama Pat, talk to this person. And that's what we did. Um, the other unique, unique thing about the way we were organizing was that um, it was all family members. It was all mothers and, and sisters and sons and daughters of people who are in prison. And we developed a kinship, like a family. And we were able to, at that time it was like, you heard the, the person on the video saying that they're a minister to society, it was just, you know, they deserve to be in prison and everybody should be locked up. At that time, you had I had no one to turn to, to talk to. I had nobody to support me when things were going wrong with my son. I mean, when he was in solitary confinement, I was in solitary confinement. When he didn't call, I thought the worst. Um, but with this new kinship and this human rights coalition, the family that we developed through this organization, we were able to brag about our children. We were able, able to talk about them. We were able to talk about their accomplishments. We were able to be ourselves and not be judged. Um, so that was a strong uh, tool, a, a strong avenue of uh, organizing. Another thing that we did uh, was, um, we found out was that the prison system didn't like you to make public the things that they were doing. So we started, we supported each other, and when someone was abused in prison, someone was thrown in solitary confinement, someone was beaten, some men were on a hunger strike because they couldn't stand the conditions of solitary confinement. They made a statement by going on a hunger strike. When they did that, we called the prison and we demanded that they be released. I would have never thought of doing that on my own, but with my family and my kin folks, you know, we all got, yeah, say this, say that. Demand it, don't just ask them, demand it. And we did it together and we called the prison and uh, that became a routine. We would call and they 
thought that we were a larger organization than we were because we had so many, you know, had so many people calling. So that made a big difference. And when we saw that, we said, aha, they don't like, you know, to be, for us to know what they're doing on the outside, on the inside. And we also started a, um, a uh, newsletter, which turned into a magazine. And through this newsletter, I mean, it reached just about a person in every prison in Pennsylvania. We even had these newsletters going to California. We had the newsletter going to Texas. We had the newsletter going to uh, Florida. Um, that newsletter that we developed kind of changed. We, our attempt was to change the narrative of how people were seeing our loved ones in prison. And we, that newsletter allowed the people inside to write articles, portray their artwork, their poets. A lot of the articles in the beginning was written by our loved ones who were very, I mean, my son had grown from a little 17 year old to a man and he became very articulate and he was writing articles and Celine was writing articles and it was just amazing how intelligent and the humanity that was coming out of the prison on paper and people got to read this. It was amazing about their artwork and the poems and people could see this. We just had photographs whenever we could have photographs about the people in prison, just to show the people on the outside that this is what people are really like. Because the image that they had of people in prison on the inside, it was the image was just like in Pennsylvania, it was they the worst of worst, you know. Let me just hold my hand back close because you know who knows what they're going to do so to change the image i like to think that this movement this magazine changed the image image planted a seed to show people that these are human beings inside these are not animals these are not monsters the other thing our magazine did was show the people on the inside what was happening on their behalf outside so when we sent letters newsletters on the inside, we also included articles about what we were doing out here, what rallies we were doing, what bills were being made, uh, what, what um, town halls we had, newspaper articles, op-eds, and they gained a lot of hope seeing this, oh, this is what they're doing for us, and we showed pictures. This is what they're doing for us, and then that gave them encouragement to do better, to write more, to organize more, and we really grew. We grew from a very small organization to so many prisoners writing letters and calling for help. And we helped by you know, calling the prison and uh, making a big stink about everything that they did. Um, that was another, a, another instrument that we could use to threaten the prisoners, because we started calling them threatening. If you don't let this person out of solitary confinement, we're going to have the newspaper, notify the newspaper. Um, when we had our law firm, Abolitions Law Center, we said we're going to have our lawyers call <laughs> you. So, um, yeah, those were the tools that we used. And, um, yeah, I would think that, you know, just having loved ones. The other thing we, we did was, I like to think that we're responsible for, I'm going to take the credit for it was that um, we were the inspiration for Abolitionist Law Center. <laughs> because, because Brett Root Brett Root came from the Human Rights Coalition, went to law school, opened up the Abolitionist Law Center and reached back and started helping all the people that we were talking to in prison that had you know, issues and who were in solitary confinement. So we were the inspiration for that. We were an inspiration for a coalition to abolish death by incarceration. Because I'm gonna be honest, when when we first started the Human Rights Coalition, I just I had no hope, no idea that my son was ever coming home. But as we kept growing and growing and growing, we started to think, well, maybe we can do this. And then we started meeting to start the Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration, which is made of mostly 
people who have loved ones in prison. Um, so I think we, we were responsible for that, take credit for it. Um, yeah, so uh, that's been my journey from not knowing anything to knowing a lot. I'm afraid to speak in public, to being able to speak in public, and for um, inspiring people to grow and create their own, own organizations that will help our loved ones in prison. Well, I gotta follow Mama Cut. <laughs> Um, well, first, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Robert Selim Holbrook. I'm the executive director of the Abolitionist Law Center, co-founder of the Human Rights Coalition, and Coalition to Abolish Death by Incarceration. Um, what brought me to this work was I was arrested at the age of 16 uh, for my involvement in a drug-related murder. I was facing a death sentence. I was ultimately sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. I served 27 years in prison, 10 years in solitary confinement. Um, you know, what brought me here today, um, Mama Pat so eloquent, eloquently talked about it was, um, I was part of an ecosystem or part of building an ecosystem um, from within the prison system that as a 16-year-old skinny kid that went into the penitentiary, um, we quickly had to grow up quick. And much of my early years was spent just acting out, resisting the prison system, because I knew something was, was, I instinctively knew this was wrong, what was happening. I instinctively knew that this system was wrong, that could sentence a child, that could try and sentence a child to death, right? Not succeed at that and then say, well, we're gonna sentence you to spend the rest of your life in parole, and then go upstate and then see, wow, I'm not the exception. There's hundreds of other people up here like me, but then there's thousands of other people who are sentenced to life without parole within the prison system. And just seeing how disposable we were um, made me rebel. But in rebelling, um, I wasn't rebelling with a purpose. It wasn't until I, one of my journeys into the hole where I spent close to three years straight in the hole, I met um, political prisoners. And that completely blew my mind because for me, I thought that political prisoners were from like the 60s and that to me, that was like 100 years ago in the 90s, right? The way, you know, for me to meet someone that was a member of the Black Panther Party, the Black Liberation Army, I was like, wasn't that 50 years ago? And it was like, no. Nah. And then, you know, they encouraged me to read. They inspired me to read. And it really turned my, my perspective. It really flipped me right side up, right? Because I was someone saying, like, I'm a rider for my neighborhood, but all of us were in prison for destroying my neighborhoods. And so to meet someone like a Russell Maroon Schultz, a Joseph Jojo Bowens, a Fred Muhammad Burton, who was in prison for defending our neighborhoods, right? who were in prison for holding police officers that murdered black people, black children with impunity in Philadelphia in the 60s and 70s for retaliating against them because the system couldn't hold them accountable. For me to meet them, have conversations with them, their militancy was what was needed to get through to me and other youth. But then when they started saying, well, hey, did you know that we fed people? Did you know that we secured the community so that seniors could walk around the, the, the communities at night and no one would do nothing to them? Did you know that we had health centers? Did you know um, that we, we, we stepped to uh, slumlords and made them fix up the apartments? Like, that blew my mind because that was a complete alternative government that they were creating in our communities. And I remember coming up, my, my mother was like, a a strong anti-apartheid activist in the house, so it really started connecting me like my father. I grew up with the picture of Huey Newton sitting on the wicker uh, uh, chair with the shotgun in one hand and the spear in the other. And again, that looked so far away, but it was actually in my household, but I gravitated so far to the streets, to the drug game, that I got separated from it. So it was when I came to prison, that's where I learned about political struggles. That's where I learned about abolition. And in the whole, in solitary confinement, Mom and Pat, Pat shared about how we started the Human Rights Coalition. Um, we were being so crushed and oppressed in Pennsylvania 
and it was decimated because it was the rise of mass incarceration in the 90s and there was no voices in the communities for us. And we were being dogged out in solitary confinement, spending years in the hole. I was in a special management unit, which was not just the hole, but it was the hole within the hole. Um, Russell Maroon Schultz had already been in the hole for 20 years straight. We realized that we needed someone to speak for us, but the system wasn't going to do it. And there wasn't the nonprofit industry certainly wasn't going to do it, right? So it was a really it was a really defining moment for us when we got together and said, yo, we're comrades. But in prison isn't an environment where you invite your family to another person's family. You don't really connect your family, particularly in men's prison. That's something that you hold tight because you don't want that to be used against you if anything ever went south. But we were able to build up enough trust with ourselves that we was like, yo, how about my mom meet your mom? How about my father meet your father? My sister meet your sister. So that kinship, we did that from the bowels of solitary confinement. Um, in, in two of the worst prisons, the break-in prisons in Pennsylvania. And Mama Pat talked about how we had, we, we bothered the prison so much that they thought that we were like huge. When you go to prison, 16 years old, 124 pounds, adult prison, you gotta learn to punch above your weight. And that's what many of us knew how to do, was punch above our weight. And we were very explicit that our policies, our politics were gonna be adversarial. We weren't both siding the prison system, right? And that was a problem within a lot of the nonprofits that were out there on the streets. And that when we would say, hey, they stripped us out and had us 10 days in the cell completely naked and weren't feeding us. They would say, okay, well, what happened? What's the other side? And we was like, you know what? We're gonna have our families advocate for us because this is an adversarial relationship here. And our families were the ones that when that happened to us, they didn't call up there and say, why did you do that? They called up there and said, you better get them out of the hole. You better do this. And the prison wasn't used to dealing with that. And so we really, um, disarm them and we we put them on the defensive and we still have them on the defensive. Mama Pat talked about the inspiration for the abolitionist law center. That inspiration came from the whole, from solitary confinement. We realized that we needed advocates but we realized we needed attorneys, right? All of us knew the law, right? I had to learn the law. I remember 18 years old in solitary confinement, the first book I read was Black Law Dictionary, right? because this system was oppressing me with the law. So I had to learn the law as a means of defending myself, not because I believe in the law. And to this day, when attorneys come on board the Abolitionist Law Center, part of your orientation is there ain't nothing sacred about American law. It's a tool. It's a tool that we use to defend our communities, to defend ourselves. I can give two shits about it. Seriously, it's just, it, it has enough worth to me as toilet paper, right? But we have to use it to liberate our people and to help our people. And so that's the Abolitionist Law Center emerged. Brett Grody, me and Brett met when I was in solitary confinement at SCI Green. We talked about building a legal arm. We didn't have the name, but we knew we were going to build a legal arm. We actually didn't think it was, it was going to be attorneys at first. We thought it was going to be paralegals. We didn't think uh, law, school, uh, law uh, schools would be crazy enough to accept any of us, or any of us would make it through law schools, right? Because we, the urgency, we were trying to go now. now. But that was part of the project. Even now, we, we have a C4, which is involved in legislation, which is involved in elections. Again, I don't believe an abolition is gonna to come to the United States through litigation, legislation, or elections. That's going to be come through the people. That's going to be come through sustained upheaval. But as long as this system, as long as the legislation, legislative branch, as long as the elected branch, as long as the legal branch can oppress and harm our people, that is an area, that is a space that we are going to contest in. That is a space where we are going to make sure that our voices are heard and we can push back. Um, so all of this certainly emerged from uh, the prison system. It's an ecosystem in Pennsylvania that we built from within this prison system, but it couldn't have been possible with, without people like Mother Pat, without my late mother, who was also a co-founder of the Human Rights Coalition, without people like Ms. Didi, without people like my sister, who came here to Geneva in 2009 when I was serving life without parole as a juvenile, to advocate in front of the UN to abolish life without parole sentences for children. We succeeded in that to an extent, although the United States still does it, there was a window where myself and hundreds of other people, including, including Mama Pat's son, 
were able to escape, escape out, slide out, because that's what Russell Maroon said. He said, man, this is a legalized jailbreak. Y'all better get out while you can, because this door is gonna close. Um, so that's what brings me to the work. And then the work we do today, again, I, like we challenge the carceral state from the front end to the back, and I think that's the best way I could say it. We, solitary confinement, extreme sentencing, police brutality, um, legislation, um, you name it, if it's dealing with the carceral state, we probably do too much, right? Um, but I think everyone who's involved in this work understands that we can never do enough, right? So um, that's just some of uh, the work I do and how, what brought me here. Thank you all for sharing your stories. Um, I think that we've all talked about how incredible it has been that we are here in Geneva talking about death by incarceration. Um, so I want to ask, um, why is it important to refer to sentences um, that exceed life expectancy as DBI or death by incarceration? Um, and can you also talk about how the movement to abolish the death penalty in the US relates to the movement to end death by incarceration? And I want to start with Chanel. Oh. <laughs> well, to me, it's important because what it is, is I had 62 and, and a half a life sentence. Even though it wasn't life without parole, my sentence, and this is one thing we did in New York, we didn't separate it. We didn't, you know, you had guys with life without parole, and then you had lifeless. We recognized that we was all one, especially the ones of us that had the virtual life sentences. I had 62 and a half years to life. I came to prison when I was 23 years old. That meant I was going to go to the board in 2048 as an 85-year-old man. The possibility of living that long in the New York State prison system was non-existent. And it, it, I'm, it, because of my lifestyle, my, you know, the health conditions, it was no way I was going to live to 85. You know? And so it was important for me to recognize that I was serving a death sentence. Although I didn't have life without parole, I had an opportunity to go to the parole board. That's 2048. Where are we at right now? 2023. If it wasn't for the governor, and now, I, I know you're going to say the governor, because I say this, the governor let me out. It was rap, Cooney School of Law, all my support that got me out, because they made sure my name stayed in. Any time somebody went home, they always said, get him out. Because a lot of the men that left the penitentiary, left me behind, was men I trained, that went through my programs, that went through a lot of the stuff that I developed over the years while I was incarcerated. So when they went home, they got in positions of power. You know, they got in positions, they're executive directors, they directors, they vice presidents, they all these type of things. So when it came an opportunity to get me out and they, you know, wrote support letters for me and everything, they put their titles. They said that, yeah, they're not only my friends. This is what we are doing. This is what, we, and we served time with them. We had those type of sentences. So they gave us the opportunity, give him the opportunity, and they gave it to me. So when we look at, in connection to, you know, identifying those sentences, we must identify them as death sentences because, like I said, in New York, the average age, the mortality rate in New York prisons is 57 years old and, and to 58 years old. They, they, they live past that, you survived, you made a chance, you, you lucky. I came home at 60. I went in at 23, came home at 60. So I, I, I'm a survivor, but I had a death sentence. Right? And on the international level, we have to look at this and you know, it ain't just the United States. We look at the United States, what the United States is doing to our communities. And we, and I, I didn't say this yesterday, and I should have said this. The United States needs to be shamed. You know, they should be ashamed of themselves because we're the only state that has, I mean, country that talks about disposable people. We're disposable. Those are, those are us that they put incarcerated with life without parole in these virtual life sets. They're saying we're disposable. You know, and I say that's a waste of human capacity. And so on an international level, we must pressure the United States and get the United States to understand that you people change. There's no such thing as disposable people. You know, we are human beings. And that's why I don't use the term inmate, none of that. Sometimes I used to use the term prisoner, but no, we are 
excuse my language, mm -hmm. fucking people. We're human beings, and we need to be recognized as human beings, that human beings that we have rights. Forget that. We have rights. And one of them is not to be tortured, because that is a torture center. To understand me doing 37 and a half years, y'all don't even understand the traumatic experience and dynamics of me coming home after 37 years. And when I tell people I came home, and I'm going to pass this mic in a minute, because I know we're working with time, I tell people I turned down a $52,000 a year job that required me to sit inside of a room or office all day, and they couldn't understand why I turned that down. I was locked in a cage for 37 and a half years. I did not want to be in an office space where I didn't have no movement and mobility. So that's why I turned that job down, because that was not something I wanted to do. What I wanted to do, I left too many people back there. And for me to come home and start working in these jobs and forget about all those brothers that I left back there and sisters I left back there that actually helped in my transformation, no, I couldn't do it. So I turned down them jobs and I worked with Rap. And that gave me the mobility to do it. And that's why I'm here, sitting here today. And I would like to pass the mic to whoever you want. Thank you. Thank you. For me, I think it's really important because in California, it is um, very normal for them to uh, change their um, idea of who should be incarcerated. We don't have the opportunity to have the judge listen to the case and make a decision. The prosecutor decides who gets life without. But we have people who are doing 210 years because they were under 18, so we don't want to give them a LWOP sentence or a death sentence because that could be overturned. So let's just give them extreme amounts of sentences instead. I have a, a 17 year old roommate who was in a college class. They know she physically was in the class taking a test, they proved it, and they don't care. 210 years. It makes no effing sense. And that is normal every day. I have at there's eight people in a cell in the institution that I was in, and I had seven people in the room with me um, at any given time because, of course, they um, incarcerate uh, anyone and everyone, and none of them weren't lifers. Every single one was a lifer or serving um, an LWOP sentence. And when we started talking about the space, um, you know, and what it would look like, people with LWOP were like, what do I say? Because I don't know if I can cap my years off at, at 30, even though that's when the board lets you, you know, have an opportunity. And it was kind of a, a slap in the face because we found out shortly thereafter, it was a lie. We thought that after 30 years you went to board because the policy says so, and, and it doesn't exist. It is just the facade that they have for the community to believe there is a written process. Um, and so when we're looking at that, we're understanding that everyone we're dealing with around us is all doing the same time. And, and we have to, to consider it what it is and understand that whether it, it was um, 25 years or it was you know 90 years, they weren't going anywhere. We knew a lot of it had to do with our governor at the time and, and it was extremely difficult to, to, to have any mobility. And when it did start to change, we realized that the hope was there, but then the rehabilitation wasn't. Um, because of course they don't provide what you need to, um, to get the healing that they require for you to get out to, to prove yourself. And so we had to start creating that type of environment as well, that healing environment. And realizing that even then they, they were denying people access because of their time now. You could facilitate the groups, but because you had a long time, you couldn't participate in the group. And so it just, it was one more punishment after another, and we realized that every single person had to be considered for it being, we're never getting out unless we all fight together and work together to, to make it happen. And both men and women uh, you know, across the state were all starting to look at what it looks like to do life and how to change it and, and realizing that we're all doing a death sentence if we don't change it with each other. Okay, thank you so much. I don't have time for questions, so I'm gonna ask one more question for the panel. Um, 
last question is about pathways to freedom for people living with DBI sentences. So in our joint shadow report, we discussed the importance of clemency and parole. What do these processes look like in your state? And in your perspective, what needs to be done to ensure that these systems meet international human rights standards? Start with Anthony. I can remember uh, a situation where the case that was mentioned on the film, on the Philadelphia film, Pennsylvania film, where the guy had mentioned the Montgomery case that was dealing with the juveniles. The guy Montgomery, Henry Montgomery, was actually in Angola with me. When they passed that bill for them to go in front of the parole board, he had been served maybe 53 or 55 years. So when they finally brought him on the board, they still found him with a denying. After 53, 55 years, I think he went on the board again and may have got denied a second time and made it the third time. But even after all of those years, being sentenced to life, mandatory life as a juvenile, you find some kind of way to deny him. You know, and let me mention this here right quick. There's another juvenile recipient that's in here with us, Terrence when he was also in Angola with us and was fortunate enough to make parole after the second time, because I believe he was also denied the first time around as a juvenile. But these DBI sentences is creating mass incarceration around the country, not just in Louisiana. And it's, it's a death sentence. I mean, sometimes we're labor as the walking dead. You actually have a death sentence. It's just a slow death. But why are you serving that death sentence, that slow death? They're going to benefit from it because they're going to slave you for decades. I mean, you're yeah, in Louisiana, Angola sits on a former plantation. And we're doing the same work that our ancestors was doing decades ago. So you're going to slave 30, 40, 50 years until you practically break your back. And now you're in a hospital ward, in a hospital bed, wearing a diaper where you can't even take care of your own personal hygiene. And you're pushed into a room where you're dying by yourself. Um, and I'm kind of lost right now. Um, but these DBI sentences that was created from tough on crime platforms and also to keep the slave trade going. You know, it's, it's, it's geared towards blacks, the minorities. I mean, Louisiana is 75% of blacks that are serving the DBI sentences. When there's only 33% of blacks that make up Louisiana. You know, leave it at that. For California, um, they have the commutation process. It's We went through a, a very short period with uh, Governor Brown, who helped create the problem um, back in the day, and um, now decided that he would really look at some of these cases. And, and I happen to be uh, blessed. Uh, we have uh, Susan Bustamante in, in the room as well, who is also blessed to um, to be released from the sentence, but um, in that process, there is a lot of case law that, that's happening that's allowing people uh, the opportunity to um, parole as well, using you know the juvenile life or um, bills that have, have uh, benefited as well. It's just extremely difficult because it depends on the governor and what they want. Um, ours happen to be looking towards presidential aspirations, so um, he's a lot more uh, difficult to deal with, vetoes any bills that talk about reform or support, um, but um, at the same time, it's each of us doing the work of trying to help and support each other and, and give each other that opportunity. Um, we have uh, people who are writing commutations and, and court work for people because they don't know how or they're in our hospice care facility and, and can't write it for themselves 
you know, um, in individuals that, that can't uh, assist, we uh, do the work for them because the reality is we know that they deserve the opportunity to seek relief and the system is going to deny us at every opportunity. So we're extremely blessed to have the opportunity to have a lot of people paroled. We have a hundred people in California that were released and this is not just that they were released, these are all the ways each one of them are giving back to their community in that short, um, about five year period that we've had releases. And we were just trying to look at what it looks like to give back to our communities because the reality is, as you guys heard up here, you know, we're, we're told we're the worst of the worst. We heard it on the video as well. That's the way they incarcerate us. But the reality is we're the ones giving back to our community both inside and when we get out. And when we do that, we know we're helping heal the community both inside and out. And we know that's what it takes. In New York, um, the process is the governor has the sole power to grant clemency and pardon. She don't have to, she well, whoever's the governor. Right now we have a female governor. She doesn't have to go to the legislatures. If she want to give anybody, she can give as many um, clemency and pardons as she want. They can't stop it. It is in the New York State Constitution that she has the sole power. So the power to give grant clemency in New York rests with the governor. As for the parole board, that's why we have, we sponsoring the Fair Tommy Parole Board. Because prior to Como coming into office and um, Kathy Hoko, we had some governors that wasn't about parole. So we came up with the term, coined the term in New York, the deuce group, meaning that people was going to the board and getting hit with 24 months, because that's the max they can give you in New York. Two years, you get hit with two years, two years. I know I had a friend that went to the board, he only had 15, he had a 15 year to life sentence. They made him do 33 years off of that 15 life sentence. And then this is what makes it even worse for him. They let him go home in 2007. In 2007. He finally got exonerated in 2019 that he didn't commit the crime. They made him do 33 years for a crime they knew he did not commit. And they kept him in jail for all that long. And it's a bunch of people that they do that to. So that's why we, we know that if we don't enshrine it in law, that when people go to the board and they need to have a fair and timely parole, that the next governor can come in and the whole system will change again and that deuce crew thing will start right back up again. Right now, there's several mechanisms that are allowing people to go home in New York State. We have what's called the 440-20, which allows you to um, challenge your sentence, legal sentences. And then they came up recently, just passed the law, the 440-47, and they call it domestic, the Domestic Something Act. And so a lot of people are going back to court under this 440-47, saying that, y'all heard the term ACE, right? That's adverse childhood experiences. Well, they're saying based on their adverse childhood experiences that all the stuff they went through, the trauma and all they went through contributed to their criminal, you know, criminal lifestyle, whatever. And so what the courts have been doing recently is they're allowing these um, motions to go into court and then they're converting them to 440.20s and saying that we're gonna reduce your sentence in the interest of justice. And that's how they're getting around letting people go home. But that's just New York State, some of the other stuff. I'll have to talk about more later on. Um, that's it all. In um, Pennsylvania, uh, we, they just started back the commutation, uh, allowing people to go in front of the commutation board. Um, but we found that in commutation, it's like hit or miss. Uh, they will deny you. You don't know why. Um, they basically retry you. Like they always go back to whatever you did to get into prison, and they just just seem like it's, you're being retried. And if you're being retried, you'll be found guilty again. And you have to admit, even if you're innocent to go to commutation, you have to admit that you, you're you guilty when you may not be guilty. And you don't want to admit that. But if you go in front of the commutation board, you have to admit that you, you're guilty. The other thing about the, um, the parole board, um, they don't, 
Oh, the commendation board also, they don't have to tell you why they said they denied you. They don't tell you why, so you don't know why. You can't go back and prepare yourself. Also, with the uh, commutation board, the victim can uh, have a statement or come and testify and just throw the whole thing off. Where we had people who came up there and they've been like perfect from day one. And the victim came up and said something. We had one case where the victims came up and actually lied. Uh, they were young children when it happened and they actually lied and the person was denied commutation and they have to go back and look at the records to see that this was never in court, all these things that they said. But anyway, this person was denied. So it's, it's a hit or miss. Um, with the parole board, you go in front of the parole board, you're interviewed, but if you don't take, if they don't, if we, we don't even know why they deny you. We, my son went in front of the parole board, he was resentenced and he to parole and he went in front of the parole board three times before they would let him out. Um, at one point, the parole board lied and said that uh, they were denying his, his parole because he had been on parole before. He had been on parole before and violated his parole. He had life in sentence, life in prison. He'd never been on parole to violate anything, so that was totally crazy. But anyway, after the third time, um, he was finally given parole. Um, was other, one other thing, also with the life sentences, um, we consider life sentence no matter what is a uh, number of years. It could be you know years on top of years and by years. That's life sentence, like they said, beyond your expect expectancy of life. Um, but with my son, they gave him life in prison plus ten years. So you get life in prison plus you get an extra ten years, like. So that's kind of where we stand. I think Celine can talk on it a little better. No, just, just in Pennsylvania, all life sentences are life without parole for first and second degree murder. Um, and that number is, is close to 5,500 right now. Um, and if you're applying for commutation, you have to get unanimous vote from the Board of Pardons, which is five votes. Um, and that's really contributed to um, so few people, so few applicants actually getting commutation. Um, I think at the rate that the commutation board is going now, I think a couple of years ago, someone did the math. It would probably take like 120 years for all lifers in Pennsylvania to uh, come up for commutation and be released because it's that many and they're, they're releasing less than 19 a year. Um, now that's a step up because from uh, 1994 to 2019, I think only one person received commutation. Might have been like two or three, but it was it was really low. Um, it was only from pressure from Amnesty Law Project, Abolitionist Law Center, CADB, Human Rights Coalition, that that number started to rise to to the, its highest point was 19 in one year. Um, so those are the challenges that we're facing in Pennsylvania. That's why we're trying to win parole eligibility through bills that we have in the state legislature for first and second degree murder, but also for geriatric parole for people who have those terminal sentences as well. Um, we're also uh, advocating uh, for parole as the, as the uh, viable means to decarcerate, to get people home, because that's how I was, I would have never made it out through commutation because of my prison record, right? So parole for us is the means that we gotta bring people home. And in order for, order for us to do that, we have to convince a very conservative legislature to pass legislation to bring home uh, 5,500 lifers. So that's our challenge in Pennsylvania. Thank you so much, Pamela. Um, Speaking of that, we have time for maybe like one question. <laughs> All right. Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah. I am here as well for Lois Hassan, who is a political prisoner. He reviewed war crimes in Iraq, Afghanistan, Guantanamo Bay. Through his revelations, we got to know the that mass murder. Lawfare is a, is a state policy in America. It's not an accident. It's deliberate policy. So um, I'm, I'm going to say, listen to, from all of you, this is 
Although this is not a surprise to me, it still shocks me to hear your testimony and to see also um, that old man, 83, what was his name again, Sammy Robson? Johnson. That was, for me, this is just perpetuation of the slavery. You get someone, it, it's, it's a social trauma that to incarcerate these people. I come from a country where black people are, we call them, they are all black people are political prisoners in a way because they are inheriting a system of injustice. And, but not only them, I think um, there, there are many factors. They, they talked about privatizations being one of the factors, like getting money for having people in prison. This is against human dignity. And um, even in Brazil, which is an equal country, we don't have death penalty. We don't have life sentences. The max that someone can get in Europe, the max that someone can get in Brazil and Latin America is 30 years because we understand this is against human dignity no matter whatever people may have done or may have not done. And you're also talking about the, the system is political. You have a government that sits there and think, well, what is, is it good for me to sign this or not? So let's take, this is, um, let's put political pressure. I think the international state, there is a myth that America is a land of opportunities, is a land of democracy, and when foreigners listen to this, dismantle all this myth. So take the international, I would I'll say, take the international tribune because it's put names. Talk about the, the New York governor not wanting to sign in an international newspaper, you'll see him next day signing things. Yeah, so if this is a political fight, let's fight it politically because we know the justice system is there to perpetuate sentences never to review, never to anything, it's just to reaffirm itself. So, uh, and reaffirm the class struggle for the elite most of the time. So yeah, let's put the political pressure on them. I think if Europe listens to this on a more, with names in, in a basis, I, I'm not so sure the Louisiana governor will feel so free to maintain these people incarcerated. I'm just, it's just a feeling that arose where you're talking, put this in the international state, make political pressure on those real psychopaths. They are the real psychopaths. Yeah. Yeah. So put the pressure on them on an international tribune. I, I will see them as singing less louder. And I also like to ask you for your solidarity. My personal defending is about to be extradited to US crime to serve 175 possible a year sentence for a journalist for revealing war crimes. So if I also, we can join forces, use his case to talk about the people that are invisible. His case is not a single case. His case is a case of many people in America. He's gonna be trialed in the espionage court that has never, ever, ever acquitted anyone. He doesn't know which evidence is gonna be put in front of him. And he's just a journalist. He's never committed any crime. So um, yeah, let's join forces. Um, use his case to shed a light and let people there aren't being visible and use the international platform because this is so shocking, so shocking. Thank you. Hi, uh, my question is super quick and brief. Uh, my name is Hamna Mathuri at Villanova Law, which is very close to Philadelphia and Katie's too. Um, we're both really interested in public interest law and I'm more focused on housing employment. Um, but I was asking this question because we're both um, student attorneys who want to go into the system, not believing in the system, but like wanting to fix it from the inside. Um, so I know you guys probably speak to a lot of attorneys, um, but I want to hear some feedback so we can take that back to other student attorneys. Um, on what are some things that you disliked about certain attorneys or um, certain people so that way we can go back and share this message because um, law in general is just very elitist and classist and um, I'm very much like trying to change that as I'm um, coming into law. Um, so I'd love to hear your feedback and anything um, in regards to how lawyers have treated you um, or um, any sort of um, just like opinions that you have.
Oh, oh, I guess now. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, hi, thank you so much to the organizers and to all of the panelists. Um, my question is, um, if people are lucky enough to get out after decades behind bars um, with the help of organizations like those that y'all are representing here today, um, the world may have changed a lot um, since people were first incarcerated. Uh, what is the experience like of being released after so many years, and what kind of support do people need to adjust to that transition? This question is going to be for uh, Mr. Bellamy. Um, I do a little bit of reparations legislation advocacy work for New York State. Right now, New York State um, has actually passed a New York State Reparations Task Force bill. The bill has all the votes needed to pass. It only needs Governor Hochul's signature. However, we've been waiting for at least four months for her to put her name on the bill to acknowledge its existence. Um, the bill calls for a comprehensive body of policies to address um, both the legacy of New York State's involvement with the slave trade, perpetuation of laws that kind of solidify all the um, inferiority uh, statuses bestowed on Black Americans since Reconstruction and the modern day disparities of which mass incarceration is a part of. At the same time, there is strong pushback from many conservative elements within New York State. Um, and part of that pushback stems from the idea that A, the bill is only for slavery, and B, slavery was such a long time ago, quote unquote, TM, the, the trademark, uh, symbol after that, that sentence. Um, considering the very, very apparent linkages between mass incarceration today and the uh, slavery industrial complex uh, starting from back then until today, what would you say to people who try to insinuate that New York State does not need to have a reparations task force bill and how would that bill benefit those who've been I'm unjustly incarcerated. Okay, this one has to be the last one. Yeah, Sharof Aziz of um, Justice for All International. Um, I uh, saw on the in the movie it was mentioned that uh, uh, Supreme Court of United States uh, issued uh, a ruling saying that. Uh, uh, parole, uh, life sentence without parole is uh, cruel and human uh, punishment. I'm just wondering whether this ruling of the Supreme Court made any impact on uh, how um, justice um, um, reacted on this and any, any uh, developments or any improvements in terms of uh, uh, sentencing for life uh, without parole. Do you want me to do a summary of the questions, or do folks feel like they, they have? So there's a specific question for Jamal around reparations in New York State. Um, there's a question around um, what support do people need once they're released and, you, you know, in order to reintegrate into society. There's a question around lawyers and what is their role in this movement, um, best practices, maybe experiences. Um, and then a the last question, I'm sorry, I didn't catch the case, but I, I think you all heard about the Supreme Court and how that has impacted this work. Maybe one person per question, unless there's a dire need to answer. I'm, since I got the mic, I'm gonna start. In, specifically in New York. We going through that right now when um, the governor trying to get her to force her to sign a number of bills. And there's a bunch of advocacy going on to get her to sign bills. And, and the whole thing with her is that you gotta keep pressuring her and pressuring her and pressuring her. Because she, you know, next year's a political year. And the whole thing, I'm be honest with you, I don't think she's gonna do another term. Because she believes that she's beholden to the conservative element in New York and she fails to realize 
that it was the Democrats that put her in office, and particularly that New York City is what put her in office. And she's beholden to Buffalo and Rochester to serve in the party. So I don't think she's going to make it a second term. That's just my feeling. And I may be wrong. So we are waiting for her to um, sign a number of bills. But when you talk about slavery in New York State, we understand about that 13th Amendment stuff. And there's an organization called 13 Forward that's trying to deal with that 13th Amendment. And so this organization is trying to get that, that exception taken out of the Constitution. They believe they can get New York to just disregard the 13th Amendment inside the New York Constitution. But right now, again, the conservative is ruling that, that whole situation. You say, what would I say about, ask that question again, what would I say about slavery? Yeah, so there are opponents within New York State that believe that the ties that New York State has had with the financial institutions that kind of funded slavery down south up to um, enslavement itself is uh, irrelevant to New York State. They also believe that these conservative opponents, they believe that slavery as a fact is so far into the past, it has no bearing on the present day reality. And we know that's a lie because we still seeing the remnants of that right now with our educational system. Again, we talk about that education from, from school to prison pipeline. I was lucky to be able to, what we say, go across the tracks and go to what the so-called white school. But those that was left in my community, they, was, they were stuck in the black schools, didn't, never had a science class, they didn't got set frogs. And a lot of these individuals, when I ran into later on in life and while we was incarcerated, they couldn't read or write. But they had a high school diploma. How is that even possible? So we know when we talk about slavery in New York and we see the remnants, one, how you, uh, our schools are underfunded. A lot of the money goes towards police. And I think somebody at the hearing yesterday talked about there was $11 billion going to the New York City Police Department. And if you look at $11 billion going to the New York City Police Department, there's only $3,000 billion going to the um, the Department of uh, the, the Department of the, the, the Correctional Department. Come on, eleven billion dollars? Do you really need eleven billion dollars? And we talk about crime inside the inner cities. We know that in the room said it. Incarceration does this. No known statistics that say an incarceration locking people up diminish crime. If that was the fact, our communities would be the safest communities in the world because they're locking us up at so many numbers, it's crazy. So when we look at, and it's all about slavery, understanding the system, when Michelle Alexander wrote that book and she basically said the new Grim Crow, she explained that whole system to you. And that's what it is. It's no different from now to then. And I said that to other people before, we're still slaves. As many right, and I say this that we slaves based on our family. There's many rights that we do not have because of our family, our incarceration, and that was the way it was set up to take the rights of the people that you so call free. That now we say, okay, now what do we do with them? We're going to put them back in bondage through incarceration. And if you look at the numbers from 1865, prior to 1865, there was no really black folks incarcerated. It is until after the passage of the, um, when we so-called Emancipation Proclamation and the ending of the Civil War that you begin to see the population of black people entering the prison system and then other minorities that said they came into the country began to enter the prison system. So that is the change. When you explain this whole system, you could show it based on statistics and facts that nothing changed. It's just a new name. And I hope that answers your question. Um, real quick, I just want to say for when you're thinking about parole and what kind of resources you need, um, absolutely um, not denying access to housing um, and job opportunities is, is a constant, you know, they say, you know, you don't have to check the box in certain places, uh, but it happens. 
you know, by the time you get to that second interview, they're asking and you're being denied. So that's the raw reality when you get out is you're constantly fighting just to be able to uphold yourself in whatever place that is. And it doesn't matter if you're looking for medical insurance or if you're looking for an apartment. If I, I was looking for a PO box. I just needed a PO box to be able to have my mail go somewhere because I couldn't work without it. Like I needed something and I couldn't even get a PO box because I couldn't register to vote because you know, you're not allowed to vote and you can't have a, you know, you don't have car and car insurance and a, a mortgage to show them. And those are the four options that you got. So that's like the raw reality of like looking at who they are and, and what needs and they have for each individual and, and offering that support and unfortunately we don't have it. When we look at our lawyer system, it's about looking at the person that's incarcerated, not the charge, and, and actually seeing them, having conversation. I, I've done a, a couple different um, opportunities talking to lawyers about what it looks like to have that survivor in the space that doesn't know how to talk about their own situation to make you understand where they're at as they talked about the ASA and, and what that looks like, what our childhood experiences look like. It took um, me to have others tell me what my experience was because all I could see was my immediate trauma in my situation, not looking at my outside experience and, and what led me to where I am. So it's about having those lawyers pay attention to the person not just the law, not just what they think the prosecutor's gonna go after, but we will definitely talk after. Want to go. I could answer the question about the United States Supreme Court ruling. That ruling that ended mandatory life without parole sentences only applied to children, people under the age of 18. It did not apply to people 18 years or older, but also that ruling was rolled back eight years later um, to make it harder for children who were sentenced to life without parole to either be paroled and it made it easier for children to be sentenced to life without a parole again. So there was a gap for eight years where it was very hard. I'm not going to say impossible because the Supreme Court did leave the option open to sentence children to life without parole, but essentially they said you would have to find the worst case and then prove that that person could never change. 2020, the United States Supreme Court, the new, with new justices that Donald Trump appointed, rolled back the case from 2012. So um, that's just another example that in America, victories won have to be held. Right? You can't you can't rest in the United States because you get a ruling one year and think that that's going to be like that. We saw that with abortion. You know, they they rolled that back after 40 years. Um, so that ruling with a Abolishing life without parole with children does not apply for people over 18 years old. Does that answer your question? Yeah. And then a, a question that y'all asked about the attorneys. Yeah. Um, I mean, listen, that's that's a question that comes up often, particularly in legal spaces. As someone who's formerly incarcerated, someone who's dealt with attorneys from the age of 16 till now, I've had a wide range of attorneys. I've had attorneys that didn't give a shit to attorneys that were my comrades to attorneys that came into the process um, um, attempting to uh, cater to me, or, or, or how would I say it, um, kind of use me as a prop too much, where I have to be like, yo, yo, like I'm not a victim here. Like, it, like you know, I have agency. Um, so I think that it's, it's really how you approach your work, like how you see yourself as an attorney, um, how you see yourself as a human being, right? Are you an advocate before you're an attorney, right? Are you an activist before you're an attorney? Um, and then how you interact with people who are incarcerated or people who are impacted by the system. Understand that you're dealing with people who have trauma. Um, understanding with, that you're dealing with people who have who need help. Um, also understand that you're dealing with people who don't know the intricacies of this system. And you should try and educate them, walk them through it, right? Help them. Um, if they don't have that agency, help bring them to that agency, right? Um, don't patronize them. Um, meet them where they're at, where, where they're at in terms of their education, so they can, they can understand what's going on in the courtroom. Always check in after uh, a legal proceeding. Check in before the legal proceeding. Um, you know, I would just say 
you have to approach it with caution and care. Um, this profession, because it's it's a profession that I'll be honest with you, it's a it's a brutal profession. And at the end of the day, the court don't give a shit about people. It doesn't. Um, you have to get you have to care about them, but you also have to be mindful that you're dealing with a, a system that lacks compassion, and you have to be on top of your game as an attorney. And what I mean by that is. The, the folks coming in that work, that work with us, we make it clear, like, look, I want you to be compassionate, I want you to be human, but I want you to know that you need to know this law. You need to be good at it. And if being good at, good at it means you gotta be an asshole sometimes, be an asshole sometimes, because your job is to get people home, your job is to get people out, your job is to disrupt in the courtroom, but do it in a way that is going to get people home and not undermine our mission. So I hope that's helpful for you. I just want to ask them with the um, other question about so people are lucky enough to come home and you know what is their experience. A lot of see we doing I, and I can only speak for New York in this this situation. For me being on the inside, we created programs where we said your your trans your transition from prison life to community life begin day one because if you wait to the end of your sentence to start preparing to go home you're not going to be prepared. You, you haven't developed your network, you haven't developed your support base, you haven't really developed nothing, and you're not prepared to go home. So your, your release, we start. We tell guys, start preparing for release day one. But how do you tell a guy that's doing life without parole, or a guy doing something like my sentence to start paying for their release when the possibility of us going home is non-existence? That's what we think in our minds. But you explain to people, that laws change. There's always an opportunity. And in, 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 in this book called The Meaning of Life, there's a quote that I, when I read it, it just stuck to me. And I'd like to share this quote with you. It says, hope is an important and constituent aspect of the human person. Those who commit the most adherent and egregious act of, of, of acts and who inflict untold suffering upon others, nevertheless retain their fundamental humanity and carry within themselves the, the capacity to change. To deny them the experience of hope would be to, to deny a fundamental aspect of their humanity, and to do that, we would be degrading. And, this, and that's what we tell guys in there. Start preparing, and then on the outside, for us, the ones who made it home, we should be have wraparound services for these guys. And, and I, mommy, I keep saying guys, I mean, all women too is just, I've been in a maximum security prison with men for so long, I, I'm used to speaking in that singular term of guys, men. But it's for women too, it needs to be wraparound services. And we don't depend on the state for nothing. Even though the state has an obligation to prepare us to come home, supposedly rehabilitate us, we say no, we don't depend on the state for nothing because if we sit back and wait for the state to do anything for us, it's never gonna get done. So we have to do it ourselves. So like they created that um, organization inside. In New York, we did the same thing. They probably did that in Louisiana. We did that. We had, I sat down with a commissioner of corrections and he basically told us the best programs inside the prison environment was created by us because we know what we need, we know what we want, and we know what we need to survive. And so therefore, the experiences for me coming home, I had a, a network built from years of me being incarcerated that I walked straight out the street into the community. I don't say I came to the street, I entered the community and continued doing the same work that I was doing on the inside, right on, right on the outside. So that's what the experience for me and I bless you for them too because when they was doing it on the inside, they didn't wait till they came home to start doing it. So you got to prepare it from day one. I just wanted to add one thing to what Salim was saying about um, lawyering. Um, as a lawyer, I don't believe in the law, um, <laughs> but lawyering is like not worth doing to me if not done with movements, so. That's why I'm here. I'm here with my, my movement family, and that's why like, I continue to do this work. 
because it wouldn't work with me otherwise. So, thank you. We want to thank you all so much for joining us today. I know we went over time and we all have somewhere to be soon. Um, just a round of applause for Nikki for moderating the panel. Oftentimes when we have these type of spaces where um, you see people who have come home, um, the reality is that so many people have not, right? And so while we are fighting, while these, everyone here has been engaged in this work, the reality is that in the United States there are so, so many people, right, who are still serving these sentences and like Joel said, you know, they are unique human beings but their experiences unfortunately are not unique. And so that's why we're here and that's why the fight continues. So thank you all.